Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, it's 4.30, so we're going to kick off this uh, panel. It's called uh, DEMS, Collection Management. I'm Eric Longo, Executive Director of NCM. And our first presenters are Catherine Barbera and David um, Newberg, who are from the, uh, Newbury, I'm sorry, who are from the Carnegie Museum of Art, and their presentation is Archives as First Class Digital Citizens. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, everybody. I'm David Newbury. And I'm Kate Barbera. I know it says Catherine, but feel free to call me Kate. <laughs> um, and together, we've been working on the project for the time-based media collection at the Carnegie Museum of Art. Um, and it's been this really fun collaboration between the two of us. We're both information technology professionals, just from very, very different schools of thought. I mean, Kate's an a, a trained archivist, and I'm a trained developer. And together, we've sort of made this project. And it's, it's one of these things that either one of us could have done alone. So we're sort of co-presenting and co-talking through the whole thing. And so we have sort of three main concepts that we want to talk about here. <clears throat> one of those is archives, which many of you are familiar with, and sort of the archive itself. One of that is what it means when the archive becomes digital. And the third is, what does it mean for an archive to be sort of a first-class citizen at a museum? So just to give you a little bit of information about our archives, um, I'm going to take you through kind of the, the backstory of this whole project, um, tell you a little bit about our archives, tell you how this project came about before we get to the actual digital component. Um, but our archives at Carnegie Museum of Art measure about two, I'd say 2,500 linear feet, if that means anything to you guys. Just imagine. Um, like 2,500 banker-sized boxes, approximately. So not too bad for an institution that's been around since 1895. Um, but this project is dealing with one specific group of records within our archives. It's called the Department of Film and Video Archive. Um, Next slide. And so for about 33 years, the museum had a pretty active Department of Film and Video. It was founded in 1970, and it was actually one of the first of its kind in the country. Um, it was founded by a woman named Sally Dixon, who's quite a character, and if you want to learn more about her, I'd be happy to talk your ear off after this. Um, but that is a picture of her and her successor, Bill Judson, who um, took over the department in 1975, and then his um, assistant, <coughs> Sam Choi, and this <laughs> it's kind of an inside joke, but this is them working on a travel sheet. Um, basically, this is kind of their idea of work. <laughs> it's just kind of they, they had a very um, fun way of doing things. They were pretty they were characters. Um, but so the the <coughs> Department of Film and Video, they like I said, they were pretty unique, founded in 1970. Um, and part of what they were really well known for is bringing in these lesser known experimental film artists to Pittsburgh. So they were one of the first to offer these artists a way to make a living from their art. So Sally Dixon would offer them an honorarium of $500 to visit the museum, screen their films, um, and do a talk with the audience. And it, she was really part of that first wave of introducing experimental film to a broader audience, kind of professionalizing it, formalizing it, and introducing it to museums. So really taking it out of kind of the coffee shops and small galleries and people's houses and living rooms and into these more formal spaces. Um, so just to give you an example, so I am a complete outsider to this whole scene. I had knew nothing about experimental film when, this, when I started this project. So when people were telling me, this is an amazing program. The current, I mean, this isn't just me kind of um, having a big head and kind of cheerleading the Carnegie Museum of Art. Um, they actually were pretty innovative back in the day. So this is a letter from Stan Brackage to Sally Dixon in 1970. And for those of you who don't know, Stan Brackage is a pretty well-known experimental filmmaker. He's kind of like the poster child of the genre. Um, and this is him basically telling her that what you've done is the most amazing program in the country right now. Um, so this really hit it home for me. It was like, oh wow, this really is a special archive. We really do have some amazing materials. 
Um, and so, like anything, change comes, of course. And in 2003, after 33 years of serving Pittsburgh and serving the experimental film community, the museum decided to take things in another direction um, and kind of close the doors of the film program. Um, and the works of art that they had accessioned into the collection, the moving image time-based media works, were taken over by our contemporary art department. Um, which leads us to um, kind of where we are now. So when it closed in 2003, basically all of their records and papers, all of those letters that Sally Dixon created, <coughs> all of those relationships she formed with those artists were boxed up and put in the basement. Um, and the museum was basically left to deal with 1,000 moving image titles without a film department, um, which they, the people on staff did an amazing job, but of course there are gonna be some preservation problems when you don't have access to that documentation. So just to give you an example, this is the big video chair. It's a piece by Buki Schwartz, who was a, um, an, a kind of a, an installation artist in, in 1987. This is just one of many pieces he created, but um, this is just one of 1,000 titles in our collection. And when we discovered this wonderful piece, uh, we realized we had almost no documentation about it. It was all boxed up in the archive, no way to access it. So this is one example. Um, and here is another example. This is Stan Brackage's Pittsburgh Trilogy. This is three films that he actually made in Pittsburgh with a lot of help from Sally Dixon, um, kind of highlighting different institutions around the city and what they do for people. So he filmed with the Pittsburgh police, he filmed in one of our hospitals of an open heart surgery, and he also did a film of an autopsy. And if any of you are interested, I would not um, say this is a good way to get involved in experimental film, because these films are really hard to take, so I, I wouldn't suggest this be your first foray into the field, I would, I would say go with something else. But these are really interesting. Um, and they're very special to us because they were filmed regionally and they, yeah, they hold a special place in our collection. Um, so this brings us to our time-based media project. So in 2012, after more than 10 years of being frustrated uh, with not having access to this documentation and providing access to our moving image materials, we received a grant from A.W. Mellon um, to really survey our time-based media artworks, uh, figure out what we have, figure out how best to preserve it, and do some conservation work on it. And one of the interesting things they found out in this process is that an essential part of preserving these artworks is getting access to that documentation. So knowing your purchase history, knowing your provenance, knowing the artist's intentions. Because when you're dealing with time-based media, you're really dealing with iterative works. So you can have a single piece that is also in video, that is also versioned, that has also been migrated, that has also been digitized. So how do you know to preserve each one of those components when you don't realize the artist's original intentions? So in 2014, uh, we started a, the second phase of this project, which is when I was brought on board. Um, which is really focused on preserving not only the artworks, but also the archive. And I am happy to say when they brought me on board, I discovered just how wonderful this archive really is. I mean, I just, it was really a, an adventure. Um, so that's kind of how this project came about, um, why we decided to work with just this collection out of our larger archives. Um, so just to give you some examples, we it just of the awesome information we've discovered. Uh, it is full of wonderful images. So in addition to the ones we've already showed you, uh, we have tons of slides, like this example, Hollis Frampton filming at U.S. Steel in 1973. Um, let, additional letters between Sally Dixon and the artist. She really formed relationships with them. So this is a letter from her to Hollis Frampton calling him Dear Wrath of God. That was kind of her nickname for him. <laughs> and if any of you are interested in beefing up your letter writing skills, when we launch in December, I suggest you go and look at Sally Dixon's letters because I have learned so much about how to write a really warming and um, kind of engaging letter from her. So there's a tip. Um, we also have these wonderful letterpress posters um, 
over 100 of them from something called the Visiting Filmmakers Series. So the honorarium I was talking about earlier that she offered these filmmakers um, was all part of an ongoing series that she hosted. And um, yeah, these are kind of the posters advertising it. So we have a lot of ephemera related to these. And so that brings us to our current project. Um, so when David and I first started to talk about how to provide public access to these materials, we knew that we would have to have two big ideas in mind, um, kind of access and sustainability. And the challenge of balancing those two has been kind of our major focus for this project. And the notes showed up there, but that's okay. This has sort of been a constant collaboration between the two of us from almost the beginning of the project. And, you know, it's, it's the, there's, there, we have two different languages that we both speak, but it's a lot about finding where the similarities are. And, and it's, we both have these concepts that are really useful. You know, I'm coming from digital, so I'm like, hey, we should do linked data in this project, which is, a, as far as we can tell, sort of a foreign concept in archives. And I've been learning all about sort of these really, really rich, detailed hierarchies that archives bring that are really, really useful for the, the technical things that we're doing. And we're working on finding this balance, sort of a middle path between mass digitization, where we go out and we scan everything as quickly as possible, and we put it all in folders, um, and then it just sits, we now have a giant pile of documents and a giant pile of files. And, but there's also this idea of sort of, um, preservation of these things, putting tons and tons of effort into taking care of the objects themselves and then putting them on a shelf where they can wait another 30 years before anybody looks at them again. And you know, both of us are coming from traditions and digital obviously prioritizes access. And archivals, the archival practice, you know, prioritizes preservation. And so it's been this compromise between the two of us to find the right way to both get our aims, but do it in a way where the other one comes away happy. And so access is sort of this big picture thing. Um, do you want to take it from here? Sure. So in trying to figure out how to provide access to these materials, because we really believe that they would be valuable not only to other institutions as they try to preserve their time-based media art, but also to the public. We wanted to share this story of film in Pittsburgh. Um, we realized that people are not gonna come to Pittsburgh to look at these materials. If we want them to have a broad audience, we need to put them online. Um, so digitization was really, from the get-go, the only way we could do this. Um, and so that's where kind of David comes in. We had to put the digital audience first. This is not about um, kind of creating those traditional finding aids. It's more about thinking, okay, how can we make this a digital project? Because Finding aids really prioritize finding the physical objects there, but you have to be at the archive for them to be useful. So if we think about this archive as being a tool for discovery for digital visitors first, it's not that we don't do the finding aids, it's not that we don't follow archival practice, but we have to think about the audience that we're actually going to get, not the theoretical audience that we could have. <clears throat> and it's also important to think about the fact that we, we need a website, but the website's just a display of the data that we have about this material. And data is really important, but data is really just a display for the things themselves. Data is not the core thing. The thing is the thing itself. And that sort of brings us to this idea of sustainability, because we don't want this to be a one-off project. And there's sort of three time frames that we think about for this project. The first is the website. And we're all digital people. We all know that without constant care and maintenance, websites rot. And our thought was, in three years, if no one takes care of this project, if both of us end up doing other things, I would give the website about three years to last before things start breaking and it starts falling apart. <clears throat> if we do linked open data, that has the data itself has a much longer time frame. And we, so it's important because the website might go away, but as long as you still have access to the data, that's really important. But we know that data formats change in digital technology goes forward and without migration and support, the data itself, it'll last about 20 years. That's not what archive people think about. Archival materials, paper, that'll last hundreds of years. And that's sort of, it's this fun thing that we have back and forth, because I'm used to thinking about six month time frames and three year lifespans. And Kate is always, well, what about 100 years from now? How do we make sure that what we're doing is valuable in a century? And so it's how do we do digitization 
with the idea that this, our digitization project needs to last for 100 years. And one idea that Kate is really into is that all of our filings and our data has to link back to that physical object. So our naming scheme is the, fold, the boxes and the, the folders, and it's a way from the file name to find the physical object itself. And so we have the, if you have this data record, even with no real context, and a trained archivist will recognize this and know how to find the object which was digitized, even if all the other metadata is lost. And on the other end, we've decided, you know, if you have the record on the internet but you don't have any other information about it, we're using GUI IDs, which are globally unique identifiers, as sort of our ID to tag this, because it means that the idea for this will be unique in the entire world. So if you have this string, you know that this is the only thing in the entire universe that has this number. So our IDs are not limited. You don't have to know that it's a Carnegie Museum of Art thing to find it if it's out on the internet somewhere. You have this number that globally uniquely identifies it for the entire world. And again, it's this sort of back and forth of if you have the data and you want the thing, can we do that? If you're on the internet but you want the data and all you have is the ID, can you do that? And so we're both thinking about how do we do the sustainability thing from our different frames of mind. So in thinking about this balance, how to provide maximum access while also kind of having your cake and eating it too, um, I've had to rethink the archival process. So what does processing mean to an archivist? Normally that means, okay, I'm going to catalog, I'm going to describe, and I'm going to produce a finding aid. Um, I'm going to preserve these materials, I'm gonna stabilize them, create an inventory, and make sure that somebody else can find them. I've had to kind of rethink that concept. Um, so we are, we're dealing with 450 linear feet of material. So not only um, are we faced with a challenge, but we're faced with a big challenge. So everything I, has, I do has to be extremely efficient. Um, we're also dealing with compatibility issues between um, archival standards, which we've chosen, um, if you guys are familiar, ISAG and EAD and then also David's standards. So how do, we meet, how do we reach a compromise between my standards and his and really create um, an access point for the user? So just trying to think, like he said, how can we leave a trail of breadcrumbs so that if we lose any one of these parts, people will still be able to make the connection between the boxes, the folders, the files, the data, and our website. And one of the decisions we've made to really help this process is that we're using the same CMS, same content management system, collections management system, <coughs> that the museum uses for its collections. We evaluated a bunch of the archival tools, which are all really good, but the problem is, is that if this project, that's not that sustainability if we bring in another tool. If we use our, the same collections management system we use to handle the collections objects, to handle the archival objects, we have people on staff who understand the system we know it's not going away anywhere because this is what the museum does, is it preserves that information. And one of the other real benefits that it gives us is our curators already know how to work with this information because it's in a system that they're trained to use. And it also means that we can form these linked data connections between our own collections. If we have a letter from, if we have an artwork from Stan Brackage and we have an archival object from Stan Brackage, we can link both of those to our same party or constituent record for Stan Brackage and begin in you know, putting these connections into our data at the onset. <clears throat> and it also means that we can start using that linked data to talk about the relationships between the work. And just kind of giving the archivist perspective on this, why are relationships important? And I think it comes down to the fact that we're not just dealing with objects, are we? Like David said, we're also dealing with people, we're also dealing with events. And it's really kind of that network that makes this interesting. So how can we capture that? And for us, the answer was through linked data. And it turns out that we can also start using linked open data to do a lot of this work. A lot of the artists that we're talking about have records on ULAN or Fagetti. And so that means that Kate, as long as she's willing to make do the work and make that connection on the onset, we can take a lot of that work of putting the artist information together and outsource that to other people who have done that work already and spend more time on that core task of cataloging the unique objects that we have. We don't have to be the authority for everything in the entire archive, just the things that are unique to our institution. And it helps with sustainability, again, that as that data gets better, our archive will get better, and we don't have to do the work. It, 
<clears throat> it also means that we can't be perfect. We can't do everything. So as our, the archivists in the room know, it's impractical to catalog these materials at the item level. So no matter what, you're not always going to have an image for every single item, but how can you still leave those, that trail of breadcrumbs? So it's, it's not that we're trying to kind of create this network for every single item we have, is we're trying to provide enough information that people can get access to these items. And we're running short on time, so I'm gonna fly through some of these. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, we, the rights are really important. Kate has been working really hard on the rights, getting the rights to the objects. And it's important, one of the things that we think is really important here is knowing that we can separate the rights for the metadata from the rights for the objects themselves. And so we can release as open data all of the metadata that we collect on this without having to negotiate content and copyright restrictions for the objects themselves and the images of those objects. And archives can be first class citizens at the museum. When it comes down to it, objects are just objects. And it's really fun having this conversation with curators and with archivists because they both think of their objects as these sort of special things. And I work in the digital world and pieces of paper are pieces of paper. It doesn't matter if it's a work on paper or a letter. I mean, this here is a letter that is also a work of art, but is in the archives. This sort of blending of these things, to me, I mean, I'm not either one of these things. My job is to catalog this. And the selection criteria is really important for the domain. But sometimes they're just different classes of the same type of thing, which is a man-made conceptual work. But what really matters are the links between the people and events and the stories that connect these objects together. Without the documentation of the artwork, the artwork is less valuable. Without the document's connection to the artwork, it's just a piece of paper. What really matters are the connections between the objects, and the best way to make those connections are through people and through events and through these sort of curated groupings of objects that we've created for people. <clears throat> and so what we're going to do, our big project here, is building a website that treats these archival objects as sort of first class citizens at the museum, where we link directly from the archival object to the collection objects that are associated with it, and also the parties and events that took place in the life of this. And if we can treat all of these objects, the, the documents and the object, the artwork, and the people and the events all as first class citizens in this museum, we can tell much, much richer stories. Sort of choose your own adventure websites where these stories are linked through the content itself. Um, and one of the things that we can do here is we can also not repeat ourselves. There's lots and lots of technical work we can do here and we can skip a bunch of it. We can use linked data, we can use Dublin Core and Sidoc CRM and JSON LD to power our data behind it. We can use these existing standards coming out of the community to do really impressive things. Uh, we can use the work that IIIF is doing on image metadata and image rights to handle a lot of the work that's really hard about zoomable large scale images or multi-document images or annotations. We don't have to solve those problems because you guys, the community, has already solved it. Um, we can build everything static for sustainability because that will let us take the sort of work that we're doing and main, main, that if the server goes down, the website still exists. We don't need a support team, we just need that technical thing. Um, we can use WordPress to handle all of the content management system and just pull that in as raw data to build our websites. So we're using all of these resources. We're using you know, the IAF and Getty as linked data sources to power a lot of the content that we're generating because they're really wonderful sources of information. So we sort of, we've built this toolbox, this website will go live at the end of December. Um, and what's happening is that it turns out that there's lots and lots, of, we've created this really rich repository of information, but what we need to do is give people access to it. And so what we're doing is putting what we're calling the film time capsules. We have all of these events which happened, and what we're trying to do is build sort of the equivalent of event websites based around the archival materials with the recordings of the lectures and the posters and the photos of the event pulling all of this content from our archive and turning it into something that's browsable and interesting to a visitor, using the data that we've created for ourselves to tell stories about our own institution. And because we're doing this work sort of broadly, it means our next big project is looking into the archives of the Carnegie Internationals, which is one of these ongoing event sequences. 
Sure. Um, so part of what we've done is we don't want to make this a single project. We want to take what we've learned and apply it to other areas. And the Carnegie International, other than our kind of film archive, is kind of the next unique group of materials that we have. Um, so this is just one of example from a record from this particular archive. It's an entry form from Pablo Picasso in 1930 to participate in the Carnegie International. And up until now, they have been unable to provide access to these materials. And so this is a really wonderful opportunity to kind of take what we've learned and apply it to this next group. And the other thing that we're looking into this is as we're building this out, we're wondering how much of the technology behind this we can use to power the actual collections website itself. Because if we're going through the, all the work of building out this system, again, collections objects are just things which are linked to these stories. And so we're currently in the discovery phase of evaluating about whether we can use the same system to not just power the archives, but also the collections themselves, making these things truly first class citizens together. <coughs> And so what have we learned as we wrap this up? Um. We've learned that collaboration is difficult. We've learned that it is also rewarding. We've learned that metadata standards are not necessarily compatible, but there is value in trying to crosswalk them. We've learned that actually, <laughs> this is kind of funny, so the Carnegie does not currently have an archival program. Um, but in a way that's been a blessing in disguise, uh, we're not dealing with legacy data here. This is all newly generated content, all newly generated data, which has allowed us to make more flexible decisions. This has been a trial and error process. We tried one standard, that didn't do what we wanted. We tried one method, that didn't do what we wanted, so we moved on to the next. So it's, crea it's created a lot more work for me, but it's also been, um, very fortuitous and that we can try these new ways of kind of doing the archival process. And it also, as we're going through this process and what we're learning, our goal is not just to provide access to the objects, the collections information itself, but also all the tools that we've been generating throughout this process. So all of our tooling is open source and we've openly published, as, long, as well as all of Kate's documentation about process and systems and how we're actually making this work. And we'd love to talk to people about that and we'd love to sort of continue this work that we're doing and make it more accessible to not only within our own institution, but also to the museum community at large. So thank you all very much. And <laughs> 30 minutes? Yeah. yeah, okay. So we have time for probably a couple of questions. That is way outside the scope of this project, yeah. unfortunately, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it later, but I mean, digital preservation is its own kind of beast, um, and I think it's a challenge that archivists everywhere yeah, are scrambling to deal with because we're creating new content every day and a lot of content, and how you deal with that is a complex, yeah, it's not a one sentence answer. We're using KEEMU. Um, we are and we aren't. So we've had to be very strategic about our decisions. Um, we basically made a list of our priorities based off of kind of the traditional reasons, what needs preserved, um, and also what people find interesting um, and kind of Yes. Exactly. And also stuff that's directly linked to the accession objects in the collection. There is. So essentially, you can click through that archival hierarchy. So we've really taken advantage of that infrastructure that's already there. 
um, and a kind of choose your own adventure as you explore all of this information. <coughs> Thanks, Katie and David. Um, all right, our next yeah. presenters are Kyle Jepker, who is uh, the director of IMA, IMA, IMA Lab at the Indianapolis Museum of Art, and Bernard Prischer, professor of informatics at Indiana University, their presentation Beyond 2D, utilizing 3D scanning for enhanced collection access. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Kyle, for inviting me to uh, come to MCN for the first time, I hope not for the last time. Um, we're going to be talking about 3D uh, in the museum in particular, a pilot project that we did together uh, this spring and that we hope to build on and maybe come back next year and report to you about again. Uh, my role is to introduce 3D to you in a, in a general way and then to talk about the work of my lab in particular. Can you hear me in the back or should I talk louder? Is it okay? Okay, great. So here, here are the topics I'll try to cover. The mission of my lab, the Virtual World Heritage Laboratory at Indiana University. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about our most recent projects, including the pilot project with the Indianapolis Museum of Art and Kyle's group there, and then some conclusions. Then I'll turn it over to Kyle, who will talk more about um, 3D at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. So uh, let me start with the mission of my lab. My, the lab that I have at Indiana University where I've been for two years is just the latest instantiation of basically the same lab with a couple of different names that uh, I started in the early 1990s at UCLA and then uh, moved, it, it moved with me to the University of Virginia and then as I say two years ago I came to Indiana. When I started in the early 90s uh, I was very fascinated by virtual reality. My background was classical archaeology and uh, I had a vision, even in the 1970s, of creating uh, some kind of a digital documentation of a great physical model in ancient Rome, uh, which is 60 feet in diameter and, and has 10,000 models, little models of all the buildings of ancient Rome in the year 320 AD. And when I saw virtual reality, I was therefore attracted to it as a possible technical solution for how we could capture this wonderful monument and make it more readily available to people. At that time, virtual reality was a new term coined by Jaron Lanier, and it was common to say virtual reality is a solution in search of a problem. So with some colleagues in different disciplines at UCLA in the mid-90s, we started a lab that at that time we called the Cultural Virtual Reality Lab with the mission of trying to figure out what some of the problems might actually be that virtual reality or 3D uh, computer graphics generally might be able to solve for us. So we created a kind of a sandbox to play with technology and see how it could help uh, art historians, architectural historians, and archeologists uh, at UCLA and then uh, elsewhere in the world as we got uh, better known and, and, and got more experience. The basic trajectory of the last 20 years has been that technology has just improved dramatically and it, the cost has gotten dizzy, dizzyingly smaller. Uh, so now you get a huge amount more bang for your buck in terms of what the technology can do for you and the quality of, of how it looks and the ease with, w uh, with which you can create 3D models. And then that's on the technology side. In terms of art, the art and uh, architecture, pilot projects done by my various labs and many, many others uh, around the world have, I think, come up with the problems that virtual reality as applied to cultural heritage uh, can address. And here I just want to digress for one second and say that I've always said it's ironic that the technology, hardware and software is largely American made, but unfortunately not very much used in the cultural heritage sphere in the United States. I've just come from a conference in Vienna, so. I, I apologize in advance if I'm incoherent. I got in late last night. Um, 280 people from 26 countries. I was the only American there. And that's pretty typical. Uh, there are a couple of labs doing the kind of thing I'm doing in the United States. But for every one that we have here, there are at least 100 in the EU. And uh, the EU has poured probably a million dollars for every one dollar that American uh, 
foundations and, and, and the US government have poured into uh, the use of 3D in this field, unfortunately. But maybe things are about to change, I, I hope so. And maybe I should start coming here more often, and people like me should start coming to, to your conference, and maybe things will change faster. So what are these problems that we learn? And I'm, I'm gonna speak at a 30,000 foot level, because there are many problems that obviously we have confronted over the last 20 years, but I'm gonna speak in the most general way. Number one is documentation. So we have a lot of objects. They differ in scale from a, a, a cylinder seal or a piece of jewelry uh, to a bigger size, like a life-size statue, to something even bigger, like a building, and finally to whole cities and landscapes. They need to be documented. And that that's turned out to be, you know, that took a long time to figure out how to do, but we finally figured out how to do it and, and do it quickly and efficiently and at low cost. And we call these 3D models of these objects, the way they look today, the way they are today, state models. They show the current state of these things. Now, we used to do this in a very time-consuming, tedious, and expensive way using de dedicated pieces of equipment, such as laser scanners or structured light scanners. And I started doing this in the late 90s, was, were my first uh, experiences with laser scanning. And uh, you, here you can see me working in the mid-2000s, as late as 2010, uh, using this approach in various uh, museums. More recently, uh, something that we'd always kept our eye on from the middle 1990s, a structure for motion, a computer algorithm that allows you to take photographs all around an object, register the photographs to each other, and derive the geometry uh, of the scene uh, from the photographs alone. Recently, this approach has become really robust and, and commonplace. And you, you can see that the results that we now get from photogrammetry uh, are really good. You're looking at an object that's only about 16 inches high in Kyle's museum, and look at the quality that, that our camera could pick up, uh, the kind of, of, of quality that only a laser scanner could have given us a few short years ago. And photogrammetry uh, works on the large scale, too. So you can do an entire building or, or a landscape with the exact same, applying the exact same principles of data capture and processing the photos with the exact same software and publishing them on the web as real-time elements of a web page, like a photograph or a text or audio or video, you can now uh, put these real-time interactive 3D models on the web page, whether they're small objects or really big ones. The advantages of photogrammetry are that, first of all, the equipment you need is, is relatively inexpensive. Even the most expensive Nikon, if fully equipped, is maybe five, six thousand dollars $6,000, as opposed to a middle-range uh, laser scanner like a Faro Arm, which is $80,000, or a Breitman structured light scanner, $150,000. And those things you can only use for one purpose, whereas a camera you can use for all kinds of purposes. The data capture with uh, photogrammetry is much faster. You can do, I can do a whole statue, a life-size statue, in at most a half hour. But uh, some of the projects we've worked on in museums like the Vatican uh, took a week of uh, 12 hours a day of scanning. The data once gathered can be processed much faster uh, in, using the photogrammetric approach. So another uh, problem, big problem, that we learned uh, was useful to, to confront and solve was how to go from the state of the cultural heritage artifact what, at whatever scale to a reconstruction of it or a restoration of it. Very often the objects of interest to us have been damaged with time uh, and even to the point where they often have even disappeared with time, uh, leaving behind traces maybe in other media. Uh, and so another thing that is, is very uh, useful is to reconstruct and uh, interpret these uh, artifacts. So we have gotten involved in digital restoration, starting with the state model and building on, on top of that to bring the uh, object or the entire environment back to its original appearance. And as an example of that, I'll just show you this video clip of our restoration model of Hadrian's Villa at Tivoli, the World Heritage Site, where the standing ruins for a Roman archeological site are really well preserved, uh, often up to the up to the uh, ceiling level, but where the damage has been just so significant, the spoliation over the centuries so thorough that the way the place looks today gives you, you know, bears no resemblance to the place that Hadrian actually created in the 120s and 130s A.D. when he was uh, emperor of Rome. 
so this video clip just contrasts some few places of the 30 major building complexes, the way they look today, and then shows you our digital restoration. And I'll stop at the end of this one. This one's interesting because those statues that you see down in Nymphaeum at the end of this great hall uh, still exist, and they're in the Uffizi. Uh, which let us photogrammetrically capture the data of the, of the statues. These are the 16 Niobids, the children of Niobe, and Niobe herself is that mother figure in the middle of the group. Here's how the Nymphaeum looks today, pretty bad shape, and here's how it looked in antiquity. This clip, if you want to see the whole thing, is available on YouTube, and I should say that the real goal here was not to make video uh, renderings, but uh, to put the model into an interactive game engine, which we've done with Mellon support, and uh, that, that will be finished and out by the end of December on our digital Hadrian's Villa website. But the restoration model is only the second problem really to reach the third problem, which is the big problem that interests us as scholars, and that is to use 3D as a surrogate for time travel so that we can go back in the past make observations, run experiments, and recreate experiences that would be possible, impossible without true time travel. And I call this empiricism or empirical research supported by computer simulations. Something very common across the sciences from biology and chemistry and physics. You don't blow up a, a nuclear bomb every time you have a new idea for how to design one. You do a computer simulation of it first. And physicists have been doing that since the mid-1950s and then Simulation has spread across the sciences from there. The workflow is that you start with the state model, so the model is as accurate as possible. You make your restoration model, typically with the help of a scientific committee of experts who have been thinking about the cultural heritage object for many years. And then you put the results into a game engine so you can use it interactively, and you add plugins so that you can do the kinds of, uh, you can have the kind of physics uh, and, 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 and information and functionality that you need to run the experiment or recreate the experience that interests you. So as an example of this, let me cite our recent project to recontextualize and to understand the relationship between two very important Augustan era monuments in ancient Rome, the Altar of Peace, the Arapacus, and the Montecitorio Obelisk, the, one of the first obelisks ever brought to Rome from Egypt, Rome which now has more Egyptian obelisks than Egypt, as you may know. And we use that to do empirical, empirical or sympirical, if you will, research to see the relationship of um, these two monuments. And finally, the, the, the um, restoration model that we created was used as the major asset in a short uh, video that the museum that houses the altar piece um, put on last year to honor the 2000th anniversary of the death of the emperor responsible for all this, Augustus, Rome's first emperor who died in 14 AD. So here you can see the two monuments today, the, the obelisk on the left, the altar on the right. And here you can see our um, restoration model of the obelisk and of the altar. They look very different and they've been moved in the modern city hundreds of meters away from their uh, original location so that the original context and their relationship has been totally lost. What we found was I'm really cutting to the chase because we found a lot, but just to cut to the chase, we found that there are, uh, these two monuments are aligned to each other to create over 230 solar events each year. So Augustus created a kind of solar park where there's an alignment between the sun seen tangent to the top of one of these monuments and, and, the, and the monuments themselves. Often you can see both monuments uh, as you walk along an axial line east and west of them. And this was never known before and would have been impossible without this kind of virtual time travel that allows us to go back and make these observations and have the idea in the first place that this might be going on. Then the, the model was used, as I said, as a, a major asset in a short video that greeted the uh, visitors to this exhibition in the Arapacus Museum last year. So in terms of the mission of our lab, first it's to figure out what those problems uh, might be that would be helpful to, to professionals in the cultural heritage field and then to run some pilot projects to, to see how this might work. But we do other things. We're the home of the only scientific journal where people can publish 3D models and discuss them, digital applications in archaeology and cultural heritage. 
We have just started the first no uh, PhD program in North America in virtual heritage. If you know any young people interested in this kind of thing, please have them contact me. We're involved in public outreach, especially through a partnership with the Khan Academy. We use our restoration models as assets for their short videos. And you can see that our project in ancient Rome, I eventually did scan all that, that model that I saw of, of ancient Rome. Uh, that has had over 500,000 views in the last three years since it was posted on the Khan Academy website. Our recent projects, my last topic, involve uh, the biggest cultural heritage state model that I know of, at least the, attending the conferences I attend, I, don't, I haven't seen anyone bigger than this. It's a 500 by 500 meter state model of an archeological site outside of Oaxaca City at a place called Atzampa, which we made for INA, the Mexican Archeological Authority, which has now invited us back to do anything we want in, in the whole country because they were very happy with the results that we gave them at no cost to them and the website that we created to show the results. Here's the landing page of the website. It just went live a week or two ago. Uh, it's built upon the notion of a series of sort of Chinese boxes, 3D models, first of the entire site, and then of each of the four terraces, and then each of the buildings around the terraces, and finally the artifacts found uh, in the buildings and around the buildings on the site. I'll just show you the, the first level, the overall state model, which you can see in this slide. This is, uh, by the way, real-time um, screen capture from the website. It's not a video rendering. This was made on the basis of 60,000 photos, 50,000 taken by our drone from the air, 10,000 taken by me with our Nikon camera that you saw before on the ground. It took two months to, to composite all of these uh, photos in software called Photoscan. And even though that took a lot of time, the actual operator time was perhaps 40 hours. So that it didn't really cost that much, take that much time to create such a big and I think very nice model. You can see these numbers, these are annotations uh, that we added and Kyle will talk a little bit about more about annotations. So this is running in real time on the web and it's a el design element of a web page. So you can have text, uh, textual information about it, but you can also put hotspots on items of interest and build the annotation or the note right into the model. And then the, I'll show you the most, the, the most detailed, smallest objects are the works of art. I'll just show you one where we have not only the work of art as an interactive 3D model uh, on the web page, but also metadata about the object and paradata, which is modeling data. It's data about the modeling process. Did we fill in holes, which you op often do when you make a 3D model? We, we think that in making a scientific model, you generally shouldn't do that, but if you do, you've got to lay your cards on the table and tell people that because they may rely on those holes you've filled for some important interpretation uh, or insight that they've had, and, and they'll be disappointed to find out you've tricked them. So this, this was again done photogrammetrically, uh, just 50 photos in the lab, handheld, no special lights, studio lights. Uh, we didn't know when we went there we were gonna be asked to do the artifacts in the lab, so we just did them, and the results were quite nice. For the IMA, we had a small pilot project this spring where we made uh, five 3D models of objects in their extensive, wonderful collection. There are many, many more. There are hundreds or thousands more we could do, and hope we'll do some more uh, with them, and, and uh, they themselves have figured out how to do it anyway, so they don't really need us anymore. Of course, we're always there to help. Kyle will, will talk about some of these in, things that you're seeing now in more detail. Again, this is just screen capture from the web page, from our lab web page. Conclusions. So after 20 years, I think it's fair to say 3D has arrived in the field of cultural heritage. As costs have dropped, the ease and quality of modeling uh, have greatly uh, increased. We can publish interactive models on the web. That is something really important to stress. It's only been possible with the arrival of WebGL and HTML5 in the last couple of years. So that's a really revolutionary, important step forward. We never could do that before. And I think we figured out the general kinds of problems that concern all of us and are useful to all of us. So for scholars, documentation, analysis, and empirical study of the past. For cultural institutions, documentation, interpretation, dissemination of the uh, cultural heritage in their care. We've worked with a lot of museums, uh, the Vatican, the Arapacus Museum in Rome, Dresden State Museums, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and now the IMA. 
and we hope that we can work with some museums that are represented in this room today and others in the United States because again, this technology is, is ready to be rolled out, it's ready for prime time, it doesn't cost that much and it's really underutilized in the United States uh, as certainly as compared to the, to the European Union. Thank you very much. We had some slide issues merging, so I'm going to switch Ooh. computers really quick. Two technologists get technology to work. <laughs> At least it's late on a Friday. All right. Um, thanks, Bernie. Um, let's see, let this come up here. All right. So I'm going to talk about um, the project that Bernie and I worked on together at the IMA and how we see uh, the utilization of the 3D scans that we've started and what we hope to do in the future and how we can adjust that. Um, and continue to grow that now that we somewhat know how to do it. So this is an example of one of the ones that Bernie showed in, in his little video. I don't have the uh, actual movement here, but this is one that is a very important uh, African object in our collection and one that we chose to do and required a lot of collaboration across a lot of the museums. So I want to start and talk about how you know Bernie came to us uh, originally we got started on this, but it wasn't just me and Bernie, it was a lot of people across the museum and it required a lot of coordination to make that happen and buy-in, right? Because you know maybe somebody doesn't want us to do this in your museum, there could be those people out there, you never know. Um, so obviously, you know, having this versus this on our website, you know, typically we have just the standard images, I think is what uh, was one of the greater appeals to me is just the access that this allows for people that can't get to the museum. You know, the 3D is much more tangible, I guess, in a way than just seeing that static image on there and allowing people to see that object, the depth that it really has, um, is what really drew me into this and seeing what other museums were doing, especially over the years. You know, it's really come a long way. And as we've built out our collections online, thought this would be a really great thing to have. So, you know, I've always been really keen on doing this. It's just a matter of taking that next step to actually make it happen. And Bernie was able to help us out. So, how did we get started? Um, First of all, how many of you allow photography in your galleries? Hopefully most people in here by now, right? That's how we got started with this. We allow photography in our galleries. We didn't do it. Bernie did it. He just came to the museum one day and <laughs> decided I'm going to take some photos of this thing and create a 3D model. And then he sent it to our curator. Our curator is in his 60s or 70s. He's been there for 45 years. He had no idea what to do with it. He got a link and was like, click. And I think it didn't work in his browser because our IT Operators haven't upgraded his computer in too many years, so it didn't even work. He sent it to me. I was sitting next to my head of conservation. I pulled it up in a meeting and I'm starting, you know, playing around with it. And our head conservator looks over and he says, That's amazing. What is that? That's in our collection, right? I said, Yeah, it is. It's this guy, this professor, I don't even know who he is. He just came and did it. <laughs> so I was like, This is awesome. And so, but from right there, there's one person that I have on my side right, is that head of conservation because he saw it right away and it was something from our collection. I think that's one of the things that I think was really exciting about it is because we had something tangible from our collection. It's, you know, lots of museums are doing this already, but still when you talk to people, it's sometimes like, well, until we see it on our own, you know, it's harder to, you know, talk about technology with a lot of people. So then I got in contact with Bernie and was like, you know, this is great. How can we do this more? And he was starting up his program down at IU and so we started to talk about, you know, you know, we've got plenty of things in our collection. I'd love to have you come do more. Teach us how to do it. We want to learn how to do this. Um, you know, I, I'm happy to come talk with your students, talk about how we use technology in the museum. You know, how can we create a collaboration uh, and work on this together to make it so, you know, we both get some nice benefits out of working together. So we got into contact and then it was on me to start talking to our museum to make sure that we could do it. And so that's where the fun comes in, right? Convince me, right? You know, we've got lots of people in the museum. We need to take cases off if we want to do this. We need to get stuff in the photo studio. We can do stuff in galleries if it's on display, but sometimes that's more complicated. So we got to convince lots of people to make this happen. Um, so how did we go about giving buy-in? I kind of mentioned this earlier, having that, you know, the head of conservation right there and seeing his, re you know, response, thinking already, you know, I can spin this thing around and see the back of it. That's a lot nicer than having to look at a bunch of different images. And I could maybe mark some notes on there to, on what conservation needs to happen or where it needs to happen. Um, maybe they could start getting into digital restoration, like what Bernie was talking about, to help 
figure out how to treat something. You know, he had all these ideas right off the bat. It's like, wow, that's kind of interesting. I don't really ever hear you talking about technology like this. So like I said, having something that's tangible from our collection already there and ready to show was really powerful. Um, and so that's what I would really advocate is having, you know, when we talk about technology with a lot of our, you know, constituents in the museum, if we don't have something to show and you're just talking in general ideas, it's a lot harder for a lot of people that aren't in this every day to grasp what you're talking about. And so if you're able to, you know, have someone else come in and do something for free, really awesome like that, it's, you know, that's one way, but there's probably a lot of us in this room that can prototype something really fast. A lot of this stuff, you know, you could, there's software for your iPad, you could go and just create a rough 3D model just to start showing people in your institution, look at this neat stuff we can do. And here's one of our objects that I spent, you know, a couple of hours working on the other day. Um, making it easy, you know, everybody in our museum is always busy all the time and we never have enough staff to do anything. I think that's probably, everybody would raise their hand if they would say that here. Um, so how can we do this in a way that we're not adding to everybody's workload? When I talk with our photography department about this, they're already pulling things out of storage for, you know, digitization projects. Is it okay if they add, you know, taking the imagery of this into their process and workflow? Is that, how much time will that add? You know, so we sit down with Bernie when he came to talk to us and he shows us the process. And they're like, you yeah, know, that's not too much. And now we've got all these extra shots of the work. It's probably a nice thing to have anyway. So sure, we can start doing that. Now we've got a little bit of buy-in from that department. And so, you know, it's, I, I put backroom support here too, because hopefully you've got some friends in the museum and you can get them on your side to help you, you know, push some of these things through if they prove problematic. This one actually was really easy. But I, I always think that like when we're thinking about technology projects, these are kind of some key things to think through in trying to help get these projects moving forward. The last one, know your pain points. So there's always gonna be sticky issues with any technology project that you're trying to implement. Um, maybe it's people that are those pain points. Um, maybe it's just the inclusion of new processes. Maybe, you know, for this one in particular, if we were talking about, you know, this, this uh, object that we have here, it was on display, it's in a case. Well, that now involves installation. They've got to come remove the case if we want to shoot it. Uh, so it's coordinating with them. It's coordinating with our rights and reproductions. Usually we, we've chosen public domain things so far, so that's a little easier. But, you know, the, the more people you start to involve, you've got to kind of think about a lot of those things. So um, one thing I would say, this is a picture of Matthew, um, one of Bernie's students, doing the, the capture. Um, collaboration, I think, is key. And one of the things that and it's been really exciting for me about this is the collaboration that we've started with Bernie and thinking about how, you know, us as museums can partner. It was interesting hearing uh, the MIA talk about their collaboration with, you know, researchers up here as well uh, from different universities. There are people out there in the, in the community doing this that are super excited about it because it's, it's pretty new. We have neat stuff to shoot, right? And so there's a lot of people that probably are in your community that you could find that would want to help you learn how to do this or even get you started. And so finding those people, whether it's through, uh, you know, a courier that has no idea what, <laughs> what he's getting emailed or, um, you know, just somebody maybe that posted something up on Sketchfab uh, of one of your objects and tagged your museum in it. There's probably some of you out there that have that and just because somebody decided to do it. Um, these are all the departments that I had to work with to make this happen. Like I said, it covers pretty much everybody um, that handles our work in some way. I have registration I don't on there, but I think I talked to them probably about it too. Um, so sorry if anybody hears about this back at the IMA that was in registration. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it, it takes a lot of people, but it's not a hard process. And so it is trying to, you know, figure out where you can do all this stuff together. So um, now that Bernie and I have decided we're gonna collaborate on this and we, he's gonna come up and show us how to do it, how do we put this all together and actually get it so it's a usable thing and we can make it, you know, another tool in all of the things that we're doing with our collection. Well, first thing, you know, Bernie created all the models, um, got that all done for us uh, with Matthew, and we needed a way to get them online. That was the first thing we wanted to do, was get them online, make them available with our online collection. And so Sketchfab is a site that's like the YouTube of 3D video, 3D rendering, basically, is what I like to call it. Um, I think they might even call it that. I think you said Bernie, right? And so this will allow you to upload your 3D models and then you can embed them right in your web page like a YouTube video. So they do have a site um, that shows all your models, all that stuff, but 
It also, they have free business accounts for cultural institutions, which is relatively new, and so you get, um, you know, Mac, you can upload as much as you want, basically. And it makes it really easy to integrate that stuff. Um, here's a link to their museum site, and you can see the 24 museums that are already on there. Um, if there's other museums out there, I'm sure they're really responsive. I've communicated with their CEO um, through, those, through the site and getting this set up. Um, and here's our site on there. Right now we just have the five models, but we're you know, gonna be continuing to grow that. And then now we've integrated this into our website. So this is our online collection page for this work. And you can see there's the 3D model with the numbers or annotations that I met with the curator and had one of our curators give us little annotation points about specific things in this object that were very meaningful. And so we're able to provide an additional layer of information even in the 3D model than we had anywhere else on the website. Uh, one of the ways we're using it right now, and I'm trying to go fast because I know we're at the end, uh, docents are now using these on iPads and their tours. They already used them for images and things, but now they can pull up the 3D model and start interacting with it to talk about it with the visitors that are on their tours. So that's one of the first ways we've started to use these in our galleries. Um, for the future, what we wanted to do um, is we, our textile curator wants to have us do a, a full 3D model of her exhibition for archival purposes, but also so she can send it to one of her colleagues that can't come to the exhibition, or it's been in two years, she wants to go back and see how that exhibition was laid out. She can actually do that. So we're, we're gonna hopefully work with Bernie again on doing a full room capture and figuring out how, we, how best to do that. Um, putting key objects on iPads, that are especially ones in wall cases where you can't see around it, so that people can interact with those and see more of that object than they can you know, just visually. And then mobile tours, and, and we have 150 acres. There's a lot of stuff like Bernie was showing that we could do outside, and so we're interested in thinking about how we can, um, I know our head of security has got a drone. I don't think he's flying it around for security purposes all the time, but we did it try it once at the museum, and so can we get out there and do some cool things with the historic homes on our property and, and just the, the grounds that we have? So that's it. I know it was quick there, so we're happy to take any questions about what we're doing. Thank you. Oh, and, yeah, definitely talk to Bernie because he knows this stuff way better than I do. But I can talk about integration. <laughs> yeah. So how are you deciding like the level of detail that you need? If you're supporting conservation, you need to bring in you know, oh, sure. Like, oh, yeah. No, I, I know in the Sketchfab, we have much higher models, and maybe you can speak a little more to that than what we're putting on Sketchfab. They're more lower resolution. But um, that's, you know, well, preliminary you talks. Yeah, what sure. Well, I, if we were going to go that route, and we haven't yet, where the conservation would want to actually do that, because you're right, I mean, w the level of detail we need would probably be extremely high. Um, right now, we just use the Nikon camera, but we do have, you know, like a 40 megapixel camera that we use for a lot of our, you know, standard imaging shots that we could use to really try and capture extremely high res stuff, but we haven't tried that yet to see what the out outcome would be. I think, I think that, you know, for a re it depends again what the conservation use is. If it's just maybe this study of develop a hypothesis of how to restore the lost polychromy, then uh, I think a good photogrammetric model would be fine. But if it's uh, like looking for tool marks and trying to distinguish between different phases in maybe modern restoration uh, interventions over the last couple of centuries by distinguishing different tool marks, looking for tool marks of tools that didn't exist, you know, in a certain period and came in later, uh, we'd probably still do a structured light scan, I would say. We would, we would, we would go back to the old, old way to do it. Yeah. We, we haven't done any 3D printing yet. Oh, so there's the 3D model online. Yeah, online. Uh, yeah, so digital interaction. We, we, we do a lot of 3D printing, and, th and that, that in, in, in our lab, and we find that useful in education, and we find it useful even you know, in research, because say, take that Niobid statue group that I, I showed you, the 16 statues in the Nymphaeum. Actually, that arrangement, that we, we have no idea of how they were arranged. And there are something like two trillion permutations and combinations of how 16 statues can be arranged on five different levels of the Nymphaeum. I had a student write a paper about that. <laughs> And then the goal was to try to figure out some principles that could be applied to reduce that to a mere, you know, couple hundred, couple hundred possibilities. I remember in my old days as a humanist, art historian, archaeologist, somebody told me there are only th there are 300 ways that 
we're really happy there. There are 300 ways we can arrange these statues. I said, wow, that's terrible. We've got to get it down to one, maybe two. But 300 is good when you start, when you know that you started out with two trillion. So um, we found that having the physical printouts of those statues was the, by far the easiest, and we also made a physical model of, of the Nymphaeum, was the easiest way to discover what the principles of arrangement might be, much easier than doing it digitally. It just takes too long to do it digitally, but to do it physically, just move them around and, and look, and, uh, and, and you make progress a lot faster. But there are other reasons for using 3D prints. Yeah, so we do allow them for download uh, from the website. Like I said, the ones we've done so far are all in the public domain, and so that was that was a specific choice on our part to make sure that you know we could provide them and we didn't have to worry about copyright with them. Um, and really, at that point, then because Bernie was the one creating them and his team, then it was asking them, "Are you okay with it?" Because you know they're the ones that are creating it, and we didn't want to step you know beyond our bounds since they were doing it for us. Um, but you know, as we get into more complicated things, I'll be spending a lot of time with our rights and reproductions team probably to figure that out. But I think a lot of the things we'll focus on in the early part of this is definitely public domain things. One back here and then we'll go here. I have a question about the violin and mm -hmm. this position. So your photography department is taking this on moving forward as time allows? When my head of photography gets back from maternity leave, that's the plan. So <laughs> <laughs> they're they're low on staff, so we haven't added it in right now, but they're, they, like I said, when Bernie was here, they stayed with us the whole day uh, and just watched them do the photography and talked with them and, and built it in. And so we've been talking about how in the photo studio there's some specific things that we need to do to take into account, you know, it, having an all white background isn't ideal for this type of thing. So you need to have depth in your pictures. So how can we go about doing that in the photo studio? Because we do have digitization projects going on right now at the museum and we might as well do it while we're, while we're doing it in the studio and taking out of storage. That's the hope. I, we still have some learning to do on the processing side of things and how much, like how we can integrate that part into our workflow is the big question mark. But the photography part, it, since it is pretty quick and we have plenty of storage right now, um, right now, uh, that hopefully we should be okay capturing quite a few extra images to do this. Maybe I could just say one little point. Um, I think we could teach any, certainly a professional photographer, how to do the shoot in at most an hour or two. And we have a cheat sheet uh, which we've developed and we've sent out to photographers and museums uh, in Europe where we needed a piece done and we didn't have the time or money to go there ourselves. And we've generally gotten uh, decent results if they just read it and study it carefully, uh, which can be a big if. But uh, where we, we might still be useful, so we'd be happy to, you know, train any photographer or anybody here uh, in how to do it. But uh, we might still need to uh, do the final editing for some pieces, for complicated things. Like that African piece with how many figures are there in there? Like 14 or something. And they're very small and that, so we teach a course in how to edit these uh, kinds of objects. It involves the use of software that has the least intuitive user interface I've ever seen. It's called ZBrush, if anybody knows it. And uh, you know, the, to really get a final good professional uh, look and feel on, on something as complicated as that, you really need to run it through ZBrush, we find. And so what, I could see a situation where we could tell you how to do it, you could do many things yourselves, and then those complicated things that need the final touches, you could just FTP the, uh, the, the model as you've gotten it uh, to us, and we could take it from there and then send it back to you. Yeah, I, I don't think necessarily we're thinking about adding anybody specifically for this. We are right now in a digitization project that's grant funded. And I think that is our hope is that we can continue because we have added, been able to add staff through that grant is we're looking now at what is the next thing that we're gonna try and tackle from a digitization standpoint in hopes that what I really don't wanna have to do with our photography department is lose those grant funded people and then have to rehire people when we bring on the next one. And so we're trying to think now is how can we, because we have this really nice workflow in place, 
can we keep those people with um, either finding additional funding um, or finding out how to do it with the operating budget that we have right now. And if I could just make a pitch, I do have this new PhD program. I've got four wonderful students from all over the country have come to uh, enroll. They're going to be around for at least, they've gotten packages of five years of full support. And I'm looking for internship opportunities for them. So uh, Kyle's um, group and, and obviously the IMA is very close to where we live. So that I hope will provide some internship opportunities. If anybody else can think, has a 3D digitization project I'd like to have done over some summer in the next couple of years, contact me and, and I probably can get one of my students to, uh, to go and do it. Uh, and then keep our students in mind when you do have a full-time position because in four or five years they'll have their PhDs and some of them will uh, certainly want to become professors, others will probably want to work in a museum context. Are we making our what? Uh, it, it is not available uh, yet on the web. I hadn't thought to do that, but yeah, maybe that's a good idea. But in the meantime, if you, if you need that, if you're interested, just write me. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much.